The title of the message tonight is Dances with Wolves. <laughs> now, if, you, if you could get through the title, there's one life application point, but I got to get through the title in order for you to get to, to that. I've been personally in a study of the book of Luke, and the many interactions with Jesus really fascinates me. Jesus is always being set in, in a trap. And he's always able to teach through those traps many gospel truths. Now, many people will be in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 and onward, and will be there except for two other verses. So it's really going to be, I guess you could say, expository, just kind of staying in one specific story. Now, most people, when they look at the story, they only look at the immoral woman. But she is really only an element of the story. Really, Jesus is trying to evangelize the Pharisee. Remember, the Bible says that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And he shows his power to forgive the the most hypocritical, self-righteous Pharisees. He shows that ability to penetrate that stony heart. But many times they would just turn their head, head away. And Jesus is able to take this, in their minds, low-life, wretched, immoral person and show the transformation power of the Holy Spirit. I love when we talk about forgiveness. What about you? With that being said, I want us to accompany Jesus to a dinner that Simon the Pharisee invited him to, and as well as you and I, we're going to go and sit there with them and see what goes on. Amen? In order for us to understand this story, we need to know a few things throughout the message that will help you understand what is unfolding here, because there are many things that we just totally miss, and it's the most important aspects of the story. You know, Jesus is always blessing people, but this time we're going to see someone bless Jesus. And he's going to tell a parable that will resonate with every single one of us. The encounter opens up with an ungrateful Pharisee and a, and a grateful woman. This is the backdrop. This lady we look at, she must have had some type of prior knowledge of Jesus, and I'll tell you why in a minute. She must have heard his preaching, and her desire was to visibly go before Jesus and express her gratefulness for her forgiveness. You know, Jesus was constantly talking about how he loves sinners. And he wished that no one would die separated from him. We know that Jesus eating with Pharisees really shows that he was a friend of sinners. You'll get that in a minute. They thought they were not sinners. Remember, they looked down at their nose at other people. One could say that they were worse because they were self-righteous, people that did not think that they needed a savior. It was in a, Jesus was constantly attacking their self-righteousness, which is what moved the ball down the field towards the crucifixion. To them, they were the lowest of the low. The Pharisees were looking at them as the lowest of the low. But as Nathan Sam always says, they would sit high and look low. He says that about me, I guess. He says that quite often. <laughs> That's not true. It kind of is, but it's not about me. But they only believed that God loved law keepers. And obviously they are not law keepers. Their motive was to have a dinner to trap and disrespect Jesus and to straighten him out. And I'll prove that to you in a minute. The story is not to be confused with some same similarities of of the lady that wants to anoint Jesus' head in Matthew 26 in Mark 14, and in John 12. That's one specific story. This happened in Judea. So this is three accounts, but the one we're going to talk about is the one that is not this story. This is another place and another time. The story begins in verse 36 in the Galilee region. Here's the narrative. Now, we're not going to really do an outline because I really only have one life application point for you. But here we go. It's going to be more of a teaching type sermon, so I'm not going to plan on spitting at you. Had enough of that this weekend. (laughs) 
So let's look at the setting. Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 37. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. Let's stop there. Now Simon the Pharisee is hosting a party, and this is not Simon the leper in the other three categories. Simon is a very common name. There's Simon Peter, Simon the Zealot, Simon the father of Judas, Simon of Cyrene, Simon the Tanner, Simon the leper, Simon the Pharisee, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is, was an invitation that was given. It's kind of like inviting the preacher to eat on a Sunday morning after he preaches. Jesus may have been teaching in, in the synagogue at the time, and they said, hey, we want you to come over and eat. Have lunch with us. And the scribes and, and the Pharisees already had their own society that said that he was a blasphemer. And we know this earlier in Luke chapter 5, because he would say he could forgive sin. So when you look at this situation, Simon in his mind is in a situation where he's trying to get Jesus to incriminate himself. They are trying to gather evidence against the Son of God in Simon's house. Now, Simon is a hypocritical enemy along with the rest of his self-appointed righteous goons. <laughs> I was trying to find a better way to say that, but it's true. They were like a mafia of goodness. Thought they were so good, they were going around. I'm, I'm not going to start digging. <laughs> religious. They were very religious. The, the, the fever pitch of hostility has not yet broken out. It is still simmering. They are still accumulating the evidence. Now, what you need to know here is what did not happen. When a rabbi entered a house, it was custom to give him a kiss on his cheek, a greeting. The other guests would be sitting in a U-shaped dining couch, a dining area. And since the roads were either muddy or dusty, they would sit basically propped up with their feet next to the other person. I would not go eat <laughs> if you invited me to a Pharisee house and we all sitting and your feet is by me. But since the roads were muddy or dusty, feet were an issue, especially during a prolonged meal. So they would wash his head, his feet, his hands, and with, and, and with water and olive oil. And they would wash their face. And the guests would recline on couches and the meal would begin. Now, we have our own way of welcoming people into our homes, right? Somebody knocks on the door. We say, come on in, have a seat. Maybe we'll take the TV off. Maybe we'll say, would you like something to drink? Now, for someone to come to your house for the first time and you just yell, come in, would be considered rude. Sorry if you do that. <laughs> I said first time guests. The point is, culture matters. Now, hosting a rabbi was tremendous. It was an honor. And they were already starting out giving Jesus the cold treatment. Any rabbi would have seen this as an unwelcoming experience. So Jesus takes note, and we'll see he brings it up later. It also says that Jesus entered in and reclined. According to rabbinic tradition, he, Jesus is only 30 years old at this point, so he is not the eldest rabbi. The the younger rabbis would wait for the older rabbis to sit, but Jesus goes and sits down first. Obviously, Jesus is saying, well, I guess we're not being traditional. The shade tree's coming up. In other words, Jesus is throwing shade, which is obviously not a sin. <laughs> His response is he just sits down. Now, many in those days would just have theological discussions. So what would happen is, these rabbis would be sitting, and they would keep the doors and the windows open. It was, he, Jesus was kind of a celebrity. I don't know if TMZ was there or Fox News. or <laughs> No, they wasn't. I can answer that for you. It's a joke. Stop with the jokes. But as they were sitting there, they would have people coming in, and they would be able to peek over and watch what's going on. They would have some poor people that would also be able to come, and they would just be waiting to see if they decide to throw any food away so that they could maybe bring it to their families. Now, people would come in, and they wanted to see what was going on. So people would be standing in the perimeter during this time. So this is the setting of what is going on. Jesus has sat down, 
and there are people that are around him, and Simon is trying to set him up. And the scene is about to get a thousand times more awkward. A woman is there. Now, this woman is a prostitute, and she would not be able to just walk into a Pharisee's house, obviously. So she is probably in somewhere in the back in the dim lighting, and she is seeing this, and she must have just wanted to come and tell Jesus, thank you. Let's look at her motive. She's overwhelmed with grace and joy and wants to show her appreciation. How do we know? We'll get to that in a minute. She knows that Jesus received sinners because... She might have remembered about the party at Levi's house. What we are about to see is her response of what is happening to Jesus. Look at, let's look at the silver, the sinful woman. Luke 7 verse 37 through 38. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with her hair in he- on her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. Let's look at the tears for a minute. This lady is there. She brings an expensive bottle of perfume. She has probably found her way to Jesus. And she was probably coming to anoint his head with this, this sp- specific perfume because she was not coming to anoint his feet because she did not bring water or a towel. That's how we know. She would have seen him not get the traditional greeting and probably probably assumed that the host did not give him what he needed upon his arrival. She has witnessed all of this and she sees Jesus basically being humiliated in front of all these religious people. So no doubt she saw this being grateful she was moved to tears. We know that she was saddened by what happened because of what she does. She is weeping and she approaches his feet. She is flooded with the reality of the type of woman she was. Don't you know when you get in the presence of God, you are confronted with the type of person you are, and that could be a good or a bad thing. You know, sometimes when, and I go back to during prayer and fasting, sitting right here, I I mean, weeping and weeping and weeping and weeping. I mean, it was kind of, Ridiculous. It was very embarrassing for me because I could not talk. So I can see exactly what was happening here. Martin Luther would call it heart water. In other words, her, she, she's so overwhelmed that it's like a gulf that is coming up out of her tears, out of her eyes. Cause she is looking down at Jesus' dirty feet. Think about that. She knows that they did not even provide a servant to wash Jesus' feet. She notices his feet are dirty. What a social disgrace. Tears are running down her face. She has no water other than her tears, and they are falling on the very feet of Jesus. The Bible says that she began to wet his feet. In the Greek, it means brechko, which means to rain. In other words, it is pouring out of her, her eyes. It's heart water, as Martin Luther would say. Her emotion was so strong. She is caught up in the fact that nobody has given this man the simplest dignity of washing his feet, but my tears will do the job. Now, notice it would also be very inappropriate to come sit next to Jesus. She's not a rabbi. Women are not supposed to interact. The scandal of this woman sitting next to a rabbi would have had her thrown out. She would have been seen as possibly making a pass at him because of her history. She was known as a sinner. And to greet him on the face with a kiss would have been blasphemous in 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 the minds of a Pharisee. The question is, at what point does she receive forgiveness? I can tell you that her tears were not there to gain forgiveness. This was not a show to earn forgiveness. Her sorrow over sin and repentance is what started the act. And I'll show you that in a minute. We don't, tears do not equal forgiveness any more, any more that a desire to read your Bible equals forgiveness. We do what we do out of the overflow of our heart. See, she sees him being treated disrespectfully and we'll see. Her tears 
are there for the gratefulness of her forgiveness, but it's also for the way that they are treating him. Her actions towards Christ shows her repentance. Are you getting this? In other words, our faith produces works. It goes back to justification and sanctification. We know that she does these three things because of the lack of greeting. So she said, I'm going to take care of the greeting. She chose to do this for the love of her Savior. In other words, if they will not greet him properly, I will do it. So we see the tears. She dries them with her hair. She kisses his feet because obviously she could not kiss his face. And she anoints them with perfume. In other words, think about this. She is entering into his suffering and his embarrassment. She is entering in. This is beautiful. She's entering in to the humiliation that these Pharisees tried to place on Jesus. You see, we become outcast and rejected for the gospel's sake if we're living a righteous life according to the gospel. Paul and Peter would tell us that in Philippians 1, 29 and 30. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege for suffering for him. We are all in this struggle together. Look at what Peter would say in 1 Peter 4.13. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may, not, you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. And that is going to be soon. Let's look at the hair. I want to talk to you about the hair. A woman was supposed to keep her hair covered in public. That's why you see all the depictions with them wearing something covering their head or their hair up. Now, rabbinic tradition actually says that if your wife goes out with her head not covered, you could divorce her. In fact, Rabbi Mir's teaching on divorce, he said it is literally your religious duty to put her away. Now, check this out. Rabbi Hista said that a woman's leg is an incitement. Rabbi Samuel said a woman's voice is incitement. And Rabbi Shisef said a woman's hair is incitement. I mean, they're putting all of this on the women. It's up to the woman to cover herself, not to get the man to look in that way. That is absolute foolishness. Do you see the kind of bondage that women were under? And Jesus came to set them free. There was one lady that they actually uh, interviewed, and this is what she said. This really blew my mind. She said, throughout the days of my life, the beams of my house have not seen the braids of my hair. In other words, her, in her house, it was covered. The, the beams of my house have not even seen that. It was, they held it as such an honor. It's crazy to me, but it's religious bondage. Let me drive the point further. A woman was supposed to keep her hair covered, and the only time she would uncover it was the night that she consummated the marriage with her own husband during the wedding night. Now, I'm telling you all this, think of the context of this woman who has wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. Now, think about this. We know that this is an issue because they're looking at them. What is Jesus expected to do? What would you do? They would have seen this as grossly immoral, and she should be punished. This is unacceptable behavior. And the, sh the scene shifts as the woman throws shade on Simon the Pharisee, which sets the stage for the parable that we're about to talk about. See, everybody in that room was a sinner except Jesus. Sinners who tried to keep the law and sinners who didn't care about the law. But all were sinners. Luke 7, 39 and 40. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known what sort of person this woman is who's touching him. She is a sinner. Now, remember, this is what you need to know. They already disrespected him. So they're saying, you see, this ain't a prophet, because if he would have known, if he would have known that, he would, he would know what kind of woman he's dealing with. So you see, we're validated by the disrespect that we've showed him. In their mind, Jesus should have rebuked them. But here's what we need to know. Jesus loves people. Jesus died for people, not rules. He died for people because people cannot keep rules on their best day. You know how I know that? 
The rules are there to point us to Jesus. Are you getting this? But Jesus sees the cost of her sacrifice when he sees the perfume. Now, rejection would have crushed her, right? Jesus is identifying and he knows that this woman sees the pain. He's the, she's the only one in the room that recognizes what Jesus is identifying with, with the rejection. It's a beautiful picture if you understand context. Luke 7, verse 40, the parable of the two debtors. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. Now, <laughs> this isn't just a normal thing. Jesus is using an idiom. In other words, he's saying, hey, bro, I got something to say. Listen, this is what he's saying. It's very blunt. Then he says, Luke 7, 41 and 42, a moneylender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they weren't able to repay, he graciously forgave them both, end of quote. So here's the breakdown. God is the moneylender or the creditor, and the debtors represent fallen man, you and I. As the parable unfolds, the debtors cannot pay the money lender, correct? But the money lender forgives them both. Thank God. The money lender is also obviously Jesus because he is the one that would pay for our sin. So is Jesus actually forgiving Simon for being rude? Question mark. And the answer is yes. Here's what's actually going on. Jesus is pulling the curtains back and he's letting the, the parable set the table. Simon is being reminded of his rudeness, and Jesus was not going to ignore being slighted. Remember, when you look at context, it's an awkward situation. But at the same time, Jesus is showing Simon, you're a sinner too, bro. It might be 50 denarii, and you might think this woman is 500 denarii, but both of you owe. And Jesus is willing to forgive both. See, that's the reminder to us when we judge each other based on our levels of sin. Let that echo in your soul. But the parable ends with the shift. It focused from the debt to the debtor's response to grace. Simon is waiting to focus on, he's, he's keeping his eyes focused on what this woman is doing. And Jesus is showing the response of the gratefulness of the woman being given in other words, he shifts the entire scene with a question. He says in verse 42 and 43, so which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said, you've judged correctly. Look the sarcasm in Simon's voice. I suppose, like duh, when well, Jesus has backed him into the proverbial corner and he has no choice but to give the right answer. Here, Jesus is actually expect, expected to apologize for this woman's act, but actually he's saying, she's kind of making up for your foolishness. Jesus is defending her. Simon and his fellow rabbis chose to humiliate Jesus, and this unnamed woman sees the humiliation and steps in to the suffering and tries to do something about it, which is the only, and, and she dealt with it by just doing what she could with what she had. This is the life application point. Making a difference is just that simple. Just step up and whatever you can, make the situation better. That's next steps, class three. Find a need and fill it, see a hurt and feel it. That's what you do. That's how you make a difference. Find a need and fill it, see a hurt and feel it. And that's exactly what she is doing. She's saying, you know what? You can be the way you want to be. I'm going to step in. I'm going to fix this situation. And I'm identifying with what he's doing. And he's, she's basically taking all the attention. Imagine, she's this, this prostitute. And she's sitting here in this religious establishment with all these people. And she's saying, you know what? I got you, Lord. That is beautiful. That makes your, your soul want to jump for joy. Luke 7, verse 44 and 48, turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Simon, you gave me no kiss, 
but she, since the time I came in, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, and she anointed me with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Imagine the beauty of this conversation. If you're sitting at the table right now watching this, you're, you're in awe. And you're looking at these Pharisees like, whoo, look the shade in this place. Simon has been ignoring her up to this point, and Jesus is drawing attention to her. Jesus is drawing the entire attention of the room. Look at this beautiful lady taking care of the business that these people should have been doing. Jesus is saying, I entered your house. You know how this works. You know the customs. You know the reason, right? As well, this woman here, you're expecting me to make her a social outcast, and you're trying to use what I'm with happening here against me to further your narrative about me. She's making up for your dysfunctional disrespect is what she's doing. This is what she says. She, Jesus is actually throwing shade on Simon in his own house. <laughs> it's beautiful. This is what he's saying. Simon, you gave me no water. She gave me her tears. Simon, you gave me no towel. She gave her hair. Simon, you gave me no kiss, bro. But she repeatedly kissed my feet. Simon, not even cheap oil. But she gave me the most expensive perfume. This is shade 101. See, Jesus is defending the woman and applauding her willingness to suffer for her, for her and he's honoring her. Luke 7, 48. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Listen, this is what I want you to catch. This woman is not offering her love, hoping to receive forgiveness. She is responding to the forgiveness she already had and responding out of it. How do we know that? He says, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. Now, it sounds like it's past, but in the Greek, it's perfect tense, which means it didn't happen right then and there. That's past. Present tense is something that happened with a continuous effect. That's what she's operating in. The same thing with you and I. We have been forgiven, and we're operating with our love for Christ in our forgiveness. We're not doing things to gain his forgiveness. This is a picture of what? Justification and sanctification which I will preach to my dying day because that's where we get crossed. She is already forgiven. She comes to him. She's expressing joy. She's seeing what he's being slighted. She's not doing this to be like, well, he's going to notice me if I do all this. That's not what the text is saying. Her faith was producing works. What about you? Are you operating in a constant state of forgiveness? See, she had been forgiven. The guilt was gone. The shame was gone. The bondage was gone. Right living now occupied her heart. This is a transformed life is what is happening. You're seeing a woman who had a horrific past living out a beautiful present and future. Remember, a rabbi is not even supposed to talk to a woman in public. And he's, he's given her honor and he's affirming her. Luke 7, 49 through 50. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sin? The same guy in Luke 5. <laughs> he didn't say that. I, I did. And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, Simon and the boys, they, they, they refused to follow Jesus' lead. And, and, and they refused to put their focus from the sin of the woman to the response of grace. You see, faith in action comes out of our being made right with God. The question is that I want to ask you tonight is what are you doing with your faith? What are you doing with your faith? What are you doing with the forgiveness that you have in Christ? 
Are you walking out of the gratefulness of a heart of being forgiven? Or are you constantly just looking at it like the Pharisees think, well, I do this, or I do this right, I do this right, I read the Torah, I, I do all these things. That's not enough. She was so encapsulated and, and engulfed with joy and grace and peace that she was like, I got to get to Jesus and tell him I am so grateful for him. Jesus made it very clear that law keepers and law breakers all need forgiveness. And no one is right in their own spiritual bubble. You and Jesus don't have your own thing going on. It's just that simple. The gospel is the gospel. The whole event was set up to cross-examine Jesus. And Jesus made it the most beautiful picture of grace, of a person who is, I mean, you realize that Jesus is the one being blessed here. Don't you come here and worship and you want to bless Jesus? She got to bless him to his face. That is amazing. In their minds, a true prophet of God would avoid sinners like this. But in Jesus' mind, he's like, no, a true prophet is coming for these people. Be careful, those that have been saved for a while, and start to look down at people that are just coming. Or they see them in that struggle and says, oh, bless God, I've got, I'm glad I'm not like that. How are we going to close here? This is quick. Everybody would be happy that we're ending this early. <laughs> you know what I, when I saw this weekend and I saw people coming up and the grace of God never gets old. When you see people come face to face with the reality of what we deserve. When we come face to face with the reality that the Bible is 100% true, 100% accurate, that all have sinned, all have fallen short of, of the grace of God. Nobody in this room, no one does right, not even one, but in Christ, that righteousness is given to us. And our, our unrighteousness, our wretchedness was put on Christ at the cross. And now we get to walk in forgiveness. Does that mean we don't ask God for forgiveness anymore? Try that for, with your spouse. Yeah, I don't have to say I'm sorry anymore. You know, I'm, I, you know, I'm forgiven. No, it's a relationship. You want to ask Christ to forgive you. The problem is if you don't care about forgiveness then you're trampling the blood of Jesus. And the Bible says it's best you've never even heard. So I want to encourage you. The gift of God is grace. We get to go to Christ now and ask for forgiveness. Now in closing, many of you have come this weekend and experienced freedom or a new level of freedom. Now I want to ask you, what are you doing for the king? of kings and the Lord of lords. What are you doing at home? What are you doing on the job? And what are you doing in the house of God? Are you finding a need and filling it? And are you seeing a hurt and feeling it? That's how I want to end this message tonight. My challenge is do something with the forgiveness that Christ has given you. Amen? With every head bowed and every eye closed, I won't ask you to stand. I'm not going to have a long altar call. I just want to simply ask you. You can stand if you'd like. That's fine. <laughs> I just want to ask you. What is the Lord asking you to do? What, who is the Lord asking you to make it right with? You know, we talked about that this past weekend, and maybe you were like, uh, I just don't know. I, I hear what Pastor Brandon was saying. Uh, forgiveness, and I hear what Pastor Dixie was saying, and uh, forgiveness, and all these things, but man, I'm just not ready. Can I encourage you, man, after seeing this plane wreck situation, you're not promised tomorrow. Go make it right. It, like, like the verses that were quoted, at best, as best as you can, right? As best as you can, live at peace with others. If there's something in your heart towards somebody, I promise you God is asking you to make it right. I promise you. There's no need. God, what's your will here? His will is lay it down and go make it right. Leave your offering here. Stop presenting it. Pick your head up. 
Look at me and go make it right. Amen. Father, I just come in the name of your son, Jesus. Lord, and I trust that this message has penetrated the hearts of your people. God, I'm asking that you would give them a heightened expectation to hear your voice, to carry out your will. Father, we thank you for this beautiful picture of what this woman did. Father, it is so inspiring to me personally. God, I'm asking that, that it was inspiring to your, your, your children, God. And I'm asking, Lord, that they would be able to take that same humble posture of this wonderful lady in the Bible that is still nameless. And Lord, that they will take what she did as a principle in their, in the house, in the workplace, and even here at church in the kingdom of God. Lord, I'm asking whatever it is that you have placed on the hearts of your people to do with this message. Lord, I'm asking that you would give them the grace and the power to respond to what you're telling them to do. Father, if there's any here that does not know you as Lord, God, I'm asking that you would save their soul. Your word says that if we have any sin, that you are faithful and just to cleanse us and wash us from all unrighteousness. Come on, if you have not received Christ, I want you to, all of us to pray this together. And you might say, I've never prayed this prayer, and it's not the prayer that saves you. It's the fact that you are turning your heart towards Christ and that you're going to walk in obedience and salvation and power. Father, we thank you in the name of your son, Jesus. And Lord, we ask that you would forgive us and that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, we don't want to be Pharisees. God, we don't want to be people that have forgotten what forgiveness is like. God, we come to the cross again, and we ask that you would wash and cleanse, that you would give us the mind of Christ, that you would give us the power of the Spirit, Lord, to, for, for our lives to change and be regenerated. And Father, we ask that you would allow us to walk out that sanctification process and bless others as we bless you and faith and obedience. God, we thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. We thank you for being raised from the dead so we could also walk in newness of life. Father, I thank you tonight. I ask that you would bless these as they go. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Well, you can stand up and if you need prayer, you can come up. If not, y'all have a good night. God bless you.